As they said, my uh, dissertation is titled Dismantling Rape Culture, A Critical Examination of Anthrocentrism in America. Uh, you can't see the title, but it doesn't really matter. Because um, <laughs> that's not the point. So I, uh, okay, let's get this So my, so I cried to my chair at one time, and I was like, well, I'm just gonna make my dissertation different than everybody else's after I've read like 55 dissertations on rape culture as well as other articles. And so um, he said, what's gonna make it different is you're doing the research. And so I'm like, yes, that's so true. So I have a, uh, my dissertation uh, provides two, makes two contributions to rape culture. One model for problematizing the issue of rape culture and one for problem posing. So um, I'm giving you the analogy so you guys understand of a forest. So forests, like rape culture, have been festering and growing for a long time. <coughs> If violence is part of your everyday life, you're deep down in the forest, and you may not, uh, it, violence may be normalized, and it may not seem like there's any way out. On the contrary, if you are at the top, and uh, violence is away from you, um, either you, it's so far away from the time that you've been assaulted, or it just doesn't touch you or anyone in your um, life, then you may not think that rape is as big a problem as it is, until, major um, issues hit the airwaves. So I started doing my dissertation uh, June 2016, which was during the election year. And I will say that when we talk about rape culture, it may get sensitive because the issues I'm gonna bring up, um, but I'm not trying to offend anyone. This is just a counter narrative to um, how I see rape culture. So like I said, I started doing my dissertation in 2016 during election year. And as we got closer to the election, more and more women were coming forward with issues, either allegations of sexual assault or walking in on them. And so uh, I just couldn't understand how both women and men could defend certain behaviors, even if they're allegations, why we're not taking more time to listen to them and see if this is the kind of president that we want in our office. So nonetheless, <laughs> Don, uh, Donald Trump was elected president. Um, I was devastated, but I was deep into the research and I understood why. So really, society, America, is infected with a social virus. It's been infected long before Donald Trump came along. And in fact, it's the inception of our American history. So they say, the research says that uh, rape culture is like a social disease, transmitted through patterns and paradigms from person to person without the word rape ever being uttered. It's the reason why there's a silent epidemic around sexual violence, where the general population, you only hear about 16% of the general population reporting their crimes to the police, and a rate that drops to 5% for college women. And as we go through my research, we will see why. Given that my research contributions is my models, I need to give you a little bit of background so you understand. So as far as the social disease, where did this disease come from? I wanted to attack the language, our uh, language that we use in America. So the first theory that I use is media group theory. Media group theory posits that language is highly unequal because not all groups in society had an equal share in formulating the language. Uh, English language was created by white men. Therefore, they are not only, they had those definitions, uh, they formulated the definitions, and they had those definitions verified by other men. And that's why they are reflected in the language, like his, him, he. Uh, women, racial, and linguistic minorities, as, long, as well as um, uh, homosexuals or non-masculine men, are also considered muted because they were excluded from this language formulation, and therefore they are denied means to express themselves. Um, and taking pronouns like she, her, and whatever, men are always represented in the language. It also denotes our status. Mr. is always Mr., but women can be Miss, Mrs., or Miss. So it's, it's showing our availability to the man, but not the man to us. Uh, language isn't just words. It's uh, refracted and embedded in seating arrangements, in positions of power and prestige. And it may tell like suppression of what people say or how they say it. And they do so by forms of control, which could be means of laws, the forms of harassment, social ritual like religion, um, and just a ridicule of the marginalized group. So muting in America is the way we mythologize our American history. 
by saying that uh, the you know, conquest of colonialism was for the greater good of society. So the violence that was committed on indigenous people and in African Americans um, was for the greater good of society. And that's just not true. It's creating a white supremacy and um, it needs to be dismantled. Women have had been muted in the way that our character is portrayed in religious texts, also translated and formulated and verified by white men. And so uh, by portraying our character as the weaker um, sex, it, even if religion isn't part of your daily life, it permeates all through society and it reinforces a strong gendered hierarchy. Uh, women's bodies have been muted in a number of ways. It's the way our bodies are objectified, yet our mouths are filled and silenced with patriarchal symbols such as meat. Um, this lets people know that what our bodies um, are doing is much more important than what we have to say. Um, and it also fulfills men's desires about what else we can do with our mouths. Um, uh, we, muting is in the way we teach our daughters and indirectly our boys that what being attractive is much more important than what they have to say. So we teach you through fairy tales, such as Little Mermaid, Little Mermaid and other things. And um, it also teaches girls that they have to give up something if they want to get what they want, which is an ominous um, lesson, considering that one in four girls will be victims of domestic violence. And we know by definition of muted group theory that boys of color are muted, but so are our white children. When we teach Christopher Columbus and all that, it gives them the idea that it's, a, it's their right to rule over people of color, over women, over weaker nations. Um, and then boys in general, we mute them. When we say that boys don't cry, we are cutting them off from their own emotions. When we say boys don't play with dolls, they're for girls, we cut them off of being nurturers and potentially good fathers in the future. So my next uh, major theme uh, frame I used was five phases of oppression, and given the time, I would just, I think I've covered cultural imperialism in media group theory to enough extent. But the five phases of oppression are cultural imperialism, marginalization, violence, powerlessness, and exploitation, which could be labor or sexual. Um, for the interest of time, I would just mention that the cultural imperialism is when the values, goals, and accomplishments of uh, the dominant group, which is whites, are established as the norm which in Western society, everything becomes measured against men. So creating a strong gender hierarchy. Violence is always connected to cultural imperialism because the purpose is intended to cause harm, fear, um, and, uh, or to, to heal and humiliate them. Um, so, and you don't have to be directly affected by violence for the fear to get you. Um, I will mention powerlessness really fast. Uh, while we comprise 47% of the labor force, we only present 6% of CEO positions in corporate America. Um, likewise, we make 80 cents for every dollar, and when we cut that down by race, it gets um, where African Americans are paid just 60 cents for every $1 that a man makes, and then for Latinas, it's 55 cents for every dollar a man makes. Oh, so I wanted to say that uh, violence, um, you know, it's a a so form of social um, systematic oppression because of the social context that makes it acceptable and even possible, like the institution of slavery in which we'll find sexual violence fits in that too. So I wanted to put those two themes together and so we, we have here it's cultural dominance or male culture as the hierarchy and muting as being the processes of the other four faces and in this way you'll see uh, violence just becomes a symptom of the culture. But because men are also oppressed, and so are racial and ethnic people, and people with linguistic, um, you know, linguistic minorities. So I wanted to go a step further, and so I created the andres androcentric oppression model. In this model, culture and language share the same frame because they are both one and the same, and they're driving the other four faces of oppression. The inside, the black space, is like the place where we don't talk about rape culture, we don't talk about race, and it is even the same place that prevents white people from admitting or even talking about the privilege that they have innately. So what uh, the bi-directional aerials are, um, so at one end is biological, the other side is cultural, and spanning the middle is developmental. So what sets these, uh, imitates these theories apart is their invitation for other scholars to join in to continue using these two prominent theories 
and um, change the bidirectional so we have great, greater understanding and intervention for great culture. Uh, interest of time, so I use a lot of theories in my dissertation that interact with these, like social learning theory, sexual script theory. Just for interest of time, I'll just bring up just world hypothesis which says that um, good things don't happen, bad things don't happen to good people, so if you don't drink alcohol or you don't wear revealing clothing, it acts like a safe, uh, psychological safety net so that um, for women, so they don't get raped. So when somebody does get raped for either drinking alcohol um, or wearing provocative clothing, it leads to victim blaming. And we learn these things through, they seep into our unconscious through fairy tales such as Literary Riding Hood. She should have stayed on the path, she didn't, and now we blame her. So my lit review, <laughs> I had a lot of fun with this, too much fun. I was even working this into February and they're like, stop chapter two, it's so much fun. So my uh, lit review has seven major themes and uh, 20 sub themes, uh, starting from cultural imperialism of our first European settlers all the way up to the um, 2016 election. Um, in the interest of time, I would just mention the, some socializing factors. So some of the things I examined is either causing the propensity to commit violence or causing us to be, uh, perpetuating the, us to become victims. So with video games such as uh, Grand Theft Auto, they feature rape play, wherein the goal of the game is uh, you can hook up with a prostitute and when she's leaving the car, you can shoot them in the back of their head. This um, increases not in every situation, but in certain families where you're not talking about things, you're not uh, have that separation from reality and, and fiction, it can um, cause a lot of harm. Also dolls, I covered uh, toys that we give our, our daughters, and uh, research says that within 20 minutes of playing with a Barbie doll, uh, their uh, little girls as young as six are restricting calories at the caloric level um, to achieve that body size or, you know, so, and then I also looked at the trickle up and trickle down effect that's affecting America, in which we portray our young girls um, as women. So that's the adultification. And it leads uh, perpetrators to imbue like um, adult-like consent of children. Um, and also maybe increases them to like uh, place rewards on external, um, external things instead of achievements they can do that make them feel good inside. We, on the other side, we have the adultification, the youthification of women, in which women are dressed or advertised in the media as looking young, which has created a big booming uh, cosmetic industry and has procedures to, to maintain youth and appearance. And it confuses men in a situation because we pretend we don't have hair, or we pretend we don't have all these things, but really in the truth, women know that they have hair and <laughs> but we will try to achieve because we are living and supposed to operate within the definitions of men. So going over there, I did look at cultural myths that, look, that justify and legitimize rape. And um, so for some example, like uh, the purity myth, it's very harmful to healthy sexuality. Um, and it's a slap on women that do deliver children, have to manually deliver children when uh, the perpetuation of the myth of Mary um, is infiltrated in our daily lives. Also, the Salem witch trials had a major impact on improving our justice system, but has had a detrimental effect on women of um, sexual assault because the changes that they made now makes it to where they would rather put 100, they'd let 100 guilty men go rather than commit one innocent person. So that really causes a lot of harm. Also, as it turns to the language, when we talk passively, Possibly about rape, um, such as uh, the woman was raped by five men versus five men raped the woman. We forget who's doing the action, and it um, serves to go ahead and justify this. And then, as far as uh, fraternities, um, according to the Rape Abuse and Census National Network, uh, of the 90% of rapes that occur in college campuses, they're committed just by three to seven percent of college men who are repeat offenders and tend to prey on college women uh, leaving home the first year. And also, um, they're rarely held accountable and they're usually tied to fraternities <coughs> and athletics. So my uh, research with college students um, revealed five major themes and 23 sub-themes. Um, just briefly mentioned that uh, girls as young as third grade are already getting sexually harassed if they have to wear a bra, uh, before they even know what their body, uh, what, it, what it means. 
Uh, boys are also feeling muted and they also can be sexually assaulted. Uh, some of my participants said that to this day, the girl that they had sex with doesn't know that she raped them. Also, uh, sex trafficking is happening right here in Sacramento. One of my victims had been sex trafficked by her own mother for years, by multiple men for shampoo, for rent, for all this kinds of stuff. And um, yeah, that's heavy. And so, and then basically, I really focus a lot on consent and their policy literacy. And then the ultimate theme was transforming rape, col uh, rape culture. Uh, those willing to use their voice potentiate change, but we need to provide them the edu education um, and to do so early. So going back to my forest, so if we think of policies as the floor, remember they're written in sexist language because they're in English, um, and they're stagnant, and then we have leadership at the top uh, who are really in a position to make change, and either through constructive conversations um, and uh, also through curriculum. Uh, so, which I focused on, and this really needs to be happen young, as soon as children can talk, but particularly when they enter kindergarten. Okay, it's my problem posing model, and so everything stays the same on this one, except for on this one, the bi-directional models. Um, we have policy at one end, and we have leadership at the other, and curriculum spans the inside. So, and that's like to penetrate the silence and promote conversations and create more of an authentic society. So. Quickly, body safety education is about teaching children very young what's going on, what is belonging to their body, what's belonging to other people's body, because a lot of it is mystery. Uh, why not tell them about that? Then we can have cons uh, conversations about that. It's also about learning consent very young and practicing that all throughout school. Bystander education considers that there's more non-rapers than there are rapers, so building agency of voice that they can either safely intervene or that they can um, call, they can report crime if they see it. Because in cook-up culture in colleges, they, there's a lot of times we see people making up, making out and some convincer on an assault if they're intoxicated. Whether it's social emotional learning, we know there's some, it's not new, but we're just now seeing the effect, the benefits of it. And as far as um, dating and sexual violence, uh, we need them to have a, the emotional intelligence and you know, to be able to have engaged in healthy um, relationships. We'll say cultural education. We need to like respect and like identify and like acknowledge and discuss all the contributions that have made America great um, because it's gonna create a more respect for other people and society. And finally, gender diversity. You know, prior to colonization, you know, the Native Americans, they uh, believed in the five, they, they acknowledged five genders and they believed in the two-spirit tradition in which male and masculinity exists in every person, uh, to what degree. And so we need to tear down that gender hierarchy because if we consider like 50% of the population are men and 50% are women, with ethnic groups in between that, we kind of like, if we dismantle that hierarchy, then we are going to see there's going to be more potential for change. And I actually brought a sheet this to hand out. I'll have it in the back. This is talking about a gender bird, gender red person. And it's like the things that we're attracted to maybe differently than what's between our legs. And it's just, um, it's, yeah, this is my model, my problem posing model. And I had a lot of fun with this research and yeah, I'm glad I was able to share it. Thank you.